Very good. Well, thanks, Brett. Um, thanks, Fab, for uh, setting this uh, this up. And uh, I'll go through some of the slides a little quicker. I didn't get to see Fab slides before, so there's a couple duplication in there. What's really great to see is that I think both of us are seeing the same things, which shouldn't come as a surprise. It was actually yesterday um, doing a presentation uh, in Texas, and we had a professor on. We had the same thing. And we said, well, it looks like we had duplicate information. I said, no, we probably been in the industry long enough to really understand where the needs are, right? It would be quite different if someone says, you have to do this. And someone says, no, 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 you have to do that. Which, to be honest, in supply chain, we've been doing that for a long time. That's why you ask people, what's your biggest focus? And they go, oh, it's transportation. No, it's manufacturing. No, it's warehousing. And I think if you look at everything that's going on in the industry, we're starting to see that kind of boiling down to some of the things that people focus on to say, hey, during the disruptions, what is really the need? What is it that we're trying to achieve? And secondly, maybe what are some of the areas that we kind of have neglected? And I will say I've been now in supply chain for 30 years and just like Fab, most of that in logistics. And 30 years ago when I started, um, and by the way, they didn't have supply chain back then in college. So I kind of envy you folks of being in these beautiful buildings and being able to study supply chain. If I could do it all over again, I'd probably come here and start it all over again. Uh, I have a master in, in economics. And so when I started in, in logistics, my friends would go, Bart, you got an MBA. What the heck are you doing in logistics, right? No one thought that was cool. Well, that world is pretty much changed. But companies have a thing in, in common, which is they have a similar need to what it is they're trying to achieve in their supply chain, right? And every, everyone hears, hears about customer service, right? And for us consumers, it's customer experience, but everyone's trying to uh, serve that customer better. And a big part of that is logistics. It used to be like the importance was buying product and getting it at a low price, getting high quality product. And then yeah, transportation will get it eventually. Now it's like, it doesn't really matter. And as more supply chain have become truly global and there's very little price differentiation, what it comes down to and how you can differentiate yourself is actually how you deliver that product, whether it's to a business or to a store or to a consumer. Um, but we also seen a lot of issues around inventory, and that's a little bit different this year than last year. Last year, I would say we ha didn't have enough inventory because either manufacturing was closed down or transit times would take a long time, uh, and there was a lot of demand for products. And then this year, it's the opposite. We have too much inventory because last year's stuff for Christmas came too late. We still got stuck with it. Um, and then transit times came down, and by the way, now we have inflation, so consumer demand has gone down. So obviously for large companies, that's a huge issue and that's bringing down profit margin. So there's more focus around inventory and how do I get better control of my inventory? And then we obviously have all these other things that come into play like sustainability and collaboration, et cetera. And like uh, Fab mentioned, so I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but the reality is that even after 30 years, I wish I could have said by doing all these things like transportation management systems, warehouse management systems, and all this technology, we're still seeing that very of many of the supply chain functions are still very siloed, right? If you talk about collaboration, let alone collaboration with a, another shipper or collaborating with your carrier, most companies don't even have that internally. They all kind of look at their own and it's like, yeah, I wonder what manufacturing doing and supply chain planning is going, I wonder what the warehouse is doing, the warehouse is doing, I wonder what transportation is doing. What if we had this magical thing that could all bring it together? Well, a big part of that is data. And in case you're wondering kind of what's going to happen in 2023, because people are thinking like, well, fuel prices are going to come down. The war in Ukraine is going to end. COVID is going to end uh, unless you're in China, right? Because we still see huge lockdowns. I think we're lucky you're here. And all these other things, if you think they're going to go down, I kind of have to disappoint you because it's only going to get worse, right? And like Peter Hinson, who's a fellow Belgian. Yes, you got a Canadian and a Belgian coming here to present to you. Uh, I guess there's a shortage of visibility people in the U.S., Fat. Um, but anyway, uh, if you look at that, so Peter Hinson called this the never normal. And so people are always go, when are we going back to normal? We're never going back to normal. It's a never normal meaning. It's a con constant evolution. And we're going to see disruptions coming at us in bigger quantities, uh, more frequently, quicker, and they're going to have bigger effects. And what are some of those, right? So we're all aware of geopolitical issues, look at what's going on with China, with their economy, with their politics, with the aging of the population. We're seeing it on the socioeconomic 
uh, elements as well with inflation. We're seeing people demanding higher wages, which leads to strikes. We're seeing it with weather, right? This week, uh, New South Wales and Australia got hit by some of the, the, the worst uh, rains they had in many, many years. Just last week, Florida, right? Nicole is the second hurricane in Florida just in a few weeks. We see the, the river, uh, rivers being at historically low levels. Uh, that was the Rhine back in July. And then a month ago, we saw that in the Mississippi. So how do we actually, how do we actually go and tackle all of that, right? Because it seems like a lot. Well, the five basic points that I would say are, are really uh, a requirement for companies. It's first of all, different way of thinking, right? And especially in logistics. If you've ever done a change management project in logistics, and I used to do this, this when I was a Six Sigma black belt back uh, in the 90s. Is that right? There comes the old thing again. Doesn't feel like we're that old, but it seems just so long ago. But back then you would go like, hey, why can't we, instead of doing routing of fleets manual, why can't we do that in a system? And people go like, why would we change? Well, why wouldn't you? Well, we've always done it like this for 30 years, right? So we need a different mindset. And we obviously need to have use technology and we need to use that to really transform our organization. So we hear a lot about digital transformation, but it really happens in very, very small parts. So we can't really say it's a transformation. Yes, there are changes happening in pockets, but we really need a bigger part of that. And I would say a big part of that is the ability to have the talent that can handle it. Because a lot of companies can't absorb that transformation because they don't have the people that really understand how to do things differently. And that's why I will continuously say, and that's why I'm so happy to be here today at the university, is that digital talent is probably one of the most important parts to be able to get where we need to go in the next few decades. So people that are the students here that are studying this, you guys are essential to make this future vision possible. Now, as we said before, data is really a key part of that, right? And they always say, well, you can't uh, change what you can't manage and you can't manage what you can't see. So it all starts with data. And historically, if you look at supply chains, although supply chains are collaborative in nature and they're all connected, they're very disconnected from a systems perspective. Because before, when there's less systems, people would talk to each other. And now we all have systems, so we think we have to stop talking to each other, just like my kids. They have a phone, right? Do you think they call me? They don't call me, right? Do you think they even text? They use all these apps, but they've lost that habit of just kind of going down and coming down the stairs and say, hey, Dad, can we talk? They will actually, even my wife, they will text me from the other room going like, hey, we need to do this or that. It's like, why can't we just together and talk? So we lost some of that communication. And we have the same in supply chain. And what we're actually seeing, because all these huge global organizations, if you look at the amount of partners we work with today, it's actually just increasing. And especially if you have issues with getting product from one supplier, you just add more suppliers to that. So that's a challenge. So really what these platforms are really working on is to get all these players to come together, to create this connective tissue so that we can connect everyone, we can pull the data in, and then we can start working collaboratively around the data. And this is very similar to uh, app slide I uh, showed before, specifically in logistics, it's really important to understand when you look at, for example, products in movement of all these different movements that a product makes from when it comes out of the ground or whatever the product is, to when you buy it as a consumer, all these different touches. And by the way, everything that you see, everything that you buy, everything that's in this building was transported here. There is a touch by transportation. But then that is just a start, right? Just having that visibility to where things are aren't enough. And that's where these platforms are continuing to extend to say, what can we now do with the data? Because it used to be we didn't have enough data, right? And then people were talking about data stores and then data lakes. And then they went into data oceans. And I'm thinking like people are just drowning in data. So data alone isn't enough. I would say now we almost have too much data. So you need to have intelligent systems that can bring those insights to the forefront and then not just that, but then also say, how are these insights actionable? How do I take the information out of it so I know what to change in my business? So that's where we're starting to see more of that workflow capability coming into these solutions. But really, when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, why are people investing in visibility? Not just because they need it, not because they have to manage risk. And by the way, that risk is continuously increasing, but because they see value. 
And I would say four or five years ago, when visibility was still in its infancy, and I will say we none of us will claim that it's a fully mature environment or ecosystem. We're still, I would say, the leaders out there be like adolescents, right? But that's that means there's a lot of opportunity still out there. But four or five years ago, and people said, yeah, we think we need visibility. Why? Because just like Amazon, people want to know where their product is. So we need to provide that to them from a customer experience perspective. But then the question was always, where's the value? Where's the quantifiable value? Well, meantime, we figured that out. Uh, actually, at Gartner started uh, creating a document around it four years ago to help customers around that, to identify, is there truly value? How do you define the value? And then how do you use the use cases to prove that? And we actually collected over 400 use cases from customers that really showed where all the, the value is coming from. And here you see, without having to go through all of them, see some of the blocks of where we're getting that from an operational efficiency perspective, from a customer service perspective, from a sustainability, decreasing transportation costs to really say, here's where the hard dollars are coming from so that you can create a better environment, but also that you uh, are able to either help grow your revenue or decrease your, your cost. But it's also a journey, right? This is not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? Because collecting data does take time. Uh, we use a lot of techniques like artificial intelligence and machine learning. And as the word says, it's machine learning. If it was instant, we would just call it machine doing, right? So what does it take? It takes a lot of data and it takes time. And so on that journey, we see companies evolving and what they typically start is more with those operational efficiencies. How can I put things into place that immediately make a change in how we operationalize transportation or how we do certain processes in the yard? Then we go to working capital improvement. This is like a further out where we say, hey, based on having more visibility, we can now start reducing inventories. But people really need to trust the data before they actually touch their safety stock levels. And then finally, longer term, they understand that out of that visibility, out of that data, they can just start looking at new business models. So the next few slides will show, and I'm not gonna drain the slides with all the information, but it's just some different examples of how companies are using visibility. And what you'll see here with these five logos here is that people don't necessarily all use it for the same reason, right? So visibility, although you can say, well, at the core, this is what we're doing, Companies have different requirements based on their business in their industry. Automotive, you're going to see people more focused on inbound transportation because if a raw material or a semi-finished product is going to be late, that affects the manufacturing line. But if you're a retailer, probably the last mile is more important because the customer experience is going to be directly impacting your net promoter score, your customer satisfaction score, which is directly related to your revenue. You go up a point, your revenue is going to go up. You go down a point, your revenue is going to go down. So there's different reasons. And then you have companies like Heineken that actually do it for completely different reasons. They do it for sustainability. And then you see large companies, large retailers like Amazon who are using these systems that even, and I'm using Amazon as an example because probably everyone thinks, well, Amazon, don't they have it all figured out? Don't they have all of their own systems? And yes, they have own technologies, but what's also true is that probably most of the vendors are actually selling to Amazon some of their technologies. Now, Amazon won't always make that public, but there's a lot of systems that are behind it. And so do they use visibility as well. They use it in North America, they use it in Europe. They use that also for sustainability. If you look at it from a 3PL perspective, Siva Logistics is a company who globally uses visibility for different modes of transportation because they know if we wanna grow as an organization, and if you've seen them grow over the, next, over the last few years, we're doing multiple acquisitions and continuing to do acquisitions. They want to make their business more digital, digital as well and add more value to their customer base. But that's not enough. The carriers are an incredible, important part as well, right? So carriers are using these systems. They're using a little bit different because the carriers isn't necessarily a pure customer of the system in the sense that they don't pay for the system. They're the ones that are also providing the, the, the data. But what's important is some of these companies, like here, what you see with back, uh, back trucking, they're actually using it to help increase their revenue. They're really seeing it as a tool to differentiate themselves in the market, to get better service and help grow their business. Or in this case, by Rolsey, where we're seeing them using visibility 
to actually help the life of the driver get better and saying, well, my drivers used to have to do all these calls and they have to do all these things that take them away from focusing on what their core business is, which is driving. And now by automating some of these tasks, you know, we become more efficient and our drivers love it. And by the way, it's also helping uh, with the safety. So it's very important as kind of a final point here that when you look at visibility, it's not targeted at just one company. It's not just, oh, it's all for the shipper or it's just all for one side. I always call it as truly the first collaborative technology within the supply chain because it's really trying to connect everyone and provide a business proposition that can help every single company that are within that ecosystem help drive their business and become more efficient. Uh, and I've got my info here. So if you just with your phone scan that, it'll uh, download all my information, more than happy to, uh, to follow up with you. And I think we have opportunity later after the panel to respond to any questions as well. Thanks. Very good. Thank you, Bart.